first chapter of John. So let's watch this together. John, friend of Jesus and an eyewitness of his ministry, miracles, life, death, and resurrection, wrote his gospel to help us believe. To do that, he includes seven signs Jesus did that demonstrates his power. John declares Jesus the Lamb of God, Son of God, Son of Man, Jesus of Nazareth, Messiah, Rabbi, and King of Israel, all to show Jesus was fully man and fully God, sent to redeem the world. In addition to these seven titles in the first chapter of the Gospel of John, John points out that John the Baptist came as the one who paved the way for the coming Messiah, the one who would come to rescue humanity. At the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, several men and women began following him to learn from him. Many of them ended up at a wedding where Jesus demonstrated his power to bring quality to life with his first sign. So last week, we looked at how all signs point towards Jesus. And now we're to the first sign. It says in John chapter 2, on the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. As we looked last week, John is writing this eyewitness account of Jesus to help us believe. And he begins his gospel account within the beginning. He's pointing towards the fact that he had discovered Jesus was not just a great teacher or a prophet, but Jesus is God among us. And so he continues by sharing this story, this first sign that took place at a wedding. Now, I don't know about you, but have you ever prepared for something, looked forward to something, only for things to go horribly awry? That's kind of what's happening in this place. They've run out of wine, which would be a cultural embarrassment. For us, a moment just like that in my life was our wedding. Now, don't get me wrong, we're celebrating 30 years of marriage this year. That's a long time. Yes. There we are. That's what I look like with hair. And everything seemed to be going just right. But a few days before, I started feeling nauseous. I started having hot flashes. I started sweating at odd times, and everyone kept telling me, I think it's just because you're nervous, but I kept saying, I'm not nervous, I'm excited. And so then my groomsmen at the rehearsal dinner kidnapped me, they took me to a Motel 6 where we spent the night, they just shared lots of stories, but there was too many of us for two beds, and so we slept on the floor, many of us, and I woke up the next morning covered in what we discovered was chicken pox. Yeah, it's a true story. I could not have made this up. At first, I thought I must have gotten bed bugs from the Motel 6. But my aunt, who's a nurse, told me, you got chicken pox. I had never had chicken pox in my entire life until the day of our wedding. You know, what's next? Dapper, diaper rash on the honeymoon? Like, this is, this is not what I expected whatsoever. And so I, I wrote, I, I called my wife-to-be to find out if she'd ever have chicken pox. 
And she told me she had. That was a relief. And then she said, well, why are you asking? I lied to her. My first lie as an almost husband. I said, well, my cousin has it. And she said, well, tell him not to come. He'll ruin everything. <laughs> so that backfired. So a few hours later, I thought, I need to tell her the truth. I don't want her walking down the aisle and seeing me unclean and running out the back, right? So I wrote a little note telling her, I'm the one that has chicken pox, and, and I can't wait to be your husband, and I'm sorry I lied already. And, and we actually have a picture of that moment captured. There she is reading the letter, <laughs> discovering it was me, thanks to her sister. And so... The wedding goes smoothly, everything goes great, and then at the end, the pastor says, and what the bride and groom would like to invite you to the reception, but just to warn you, the groom has chicken pox. Go, enjoy. <laughs> so people would wave at me from a distance. Other people sent their children over to me. They were hugging me, all these strangers. And so everything, again, could not have gone better in some ways, but terrible in others. In fact, the next day we were flying off to Los Angeles for our honeymoon. And by then I had a chicken pock develop on my eyelid. And so I'm sitting next to this poor guy and I cannot stop winking at him the entire flight. We go to Disneyland and I don't know how many kids at the happiest place on earth may have been affected by my visit, <laughs> but their parents would probably thank me later. But how, how can you adjust when things just go horribly awry. Now, in the end, 30 years, right? It worked out okay. But I'm wondering, what would you do if things start to go awry? In this case, Mary must have had some sort of invested interest in this couple. She didn't want this cultural embarrassment. See, we celebrate for maybe five or six hours, but in the Middle Eastern culture, they celebrated a wedding for five or six days. And they're running out of wine. So why does this first sign take place at a wedding? Well, we can see at the beginning of the scripture and at the end of scripture, it begins with a couple, Adam and Eve, and it ends with a wedding banquet. God with humanity, where there's no shame, there's no separation, there's no pain, no agony. And at the very beginning, it, the scriptures tell us, Genesis chapter 2, a man leaves his father and mother and united to his wife, and they become one flesh. In Mark's gospel, he wraps it up nicely saying that at the beginning of creation, God made the male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So there are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. So this sign is taking place at a wedding, reminding us of the importance of marriage in God's eyes. And in the end, when we say yes to Jesus, the scriptures refer to us as the bride of Christ and that the bridegroom is coming again, that one day Jesus will come and make all things right. And heaven is referred to, this combination of heaven and earth, this new heaven and new earth as a wedding feast. The wedding at Cana took place it says on the third day. This is significant. By the way, have you ever seen a filmmaker who's really, really good and, and you go back and rewatch the movie and see details you'd never noticed before that point towards the story? This is true of the Hebrew scriptures. It's true of the New Testament. Like every detail matters. And on the third day, you just think he's just letting us know what day of the wedding this took place. But on the third day has significance. First and foremost, when... You know the story of Jesus. He was crucified and rose from the dead on the third day. And any time you look back and read the Hebrew scriptures, on the third day came to be associated with the day of miracles, the day when signs occurred. Just a couple of exa examples. In Genesis 22, verse 4, it says, On the third day Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. If you know the story, Abraham is going to sacrifice his son Isaac, which didn't seem like too odd of a request when all of the peoples in those days, thousands of years ago, commonplace to sacrifice your child. 
But in this case, God showed himself to be different than all the angry gods. Instead, he provided a way that Abraham would not need to sacrifice Isaac and provided that miracle of a ram that happened to be stuck in the bushes at the top of the mountain. By the way, that exact place where God provided the ram in a place where Abraham did not have to sacrifice his son, it's on that exact same mountain almost 2,000 years later where Jesus willingly gave his life and died on the cross. Where our Heavenly Father willingly gave his son to die for the sins of humanity. We also see that in this moment of a wedding, that this imagery of the bride and the bridegroom, a wedding imagery reminds us that when you're connected with God through Jesus, there is joy, there is celebration, there is promise of a new family. Jesus does not refer to himself as a bridegroom in the Gospel of John, but John the baptizer, his cousin who paved the way for Jesus does. He says this in John 3, 29. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it is now complete. See, John the Baptist, as he was called, different than John, the one who's writing this gospel, knew that he was paving the way for the Messiah. In fact, there was a real move of God where people would come out into the desert to be baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus. And he knew that Jesus was this promised Messiah. Later in this eyewitness account, John remembers a moment when Jesus said these words, you are my friends if you do what I command. Consider that for a moment. The creator of the universe walking among us, inviting us into relationship, friendship. Let me just ask you, do you consider Jesus a friend? I want you to think about that. We'll come back to that in a moment. But back to chapter 2 in John. It says that when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Jesus replied, Woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now, it's important that we not superimpose our experiences of weddings on what we're reading here. That's true of all the scriptures. It's most important to understand the context, to understand what is actually happening in the places that are being written to in the experiences that we're reading about. We need to go to the scriptures almost like a cross-cultural missionary trying to understand the context so that we can apply it better to our lives. But it's important to understand that Mary was the one who gave birth to the Son of God. And she trusted Jesus. After Jesus was born miraculously, she, in the end, Mary and Joseph get married and have other children, and Jesus has been caring for them. We don't know exactly when Joseph may have died, but we do know that Jesus was about 30 years of age before he finally stepped into his ministry, having cared for his family up until then. And so here's Mary coming up to Jesus. She may not understand or know what he would do, but she knew she could trust him with this problem. And I know you're probably wondering, well, why did he call her woman? <laughs> if I did that, my mom would slap me, all right? Well, we have to understand, again, this is being translated into a new language. It's an idiom, if you know what that phrase. Like, we say, heads up, and what do we do when we say heads up? We look down, <laughs> right? That doesn't make sense to anyone that's not an English speaker, right? We should really say, jump, or head down or something. But in many ways, what's actually happening here is an idiom. He's using a phrase, much like we would use the phrase, ma'am. It's an actual sign of respect, but there is a separation. There is a distancing. Instead of calling her mother, he calls her ma'am. If you go back several years in the story of Jesus, when he was 12 years old, his parents couldn't find him. They were on their way back to Nazareth from Jerusalem, and he was missing. 
And they finally found them a few days later. And you think, uh, Child Protective Services needs to be called. But in reality, they just would travel with their extended family, that people would care for each other's kids all the time. And they find, find Jesus still learning at the temple, pointing to his heavenly father as the one he's learning from. See, he's making the transition, no longer being the one that cares for the household under the direction of his mother. Now he's beginning to step into his new role as the son of his heavenly father, the son of God. This phrase, what to me to you, is more like saying this isn't really about us. But notice what he does in verse 26. Or sorry, I, I skipped ahead just for a second. Notice there's another point in his life where he refers to, G, to his mother as woman. It's at the cross. See, in those days, you could not depend on Social Security. There was no retirement home, no place for the elderly. The only way a woman in Mary's condition, having raised her kids, could survive was depending on her children, typically the eldest boy. And on his way to the cross, on his way to being crucified, he says this. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. The one who wrote those words, John, is the one who cared for Mary the rest of her life. In John 1.18, back to the story. Jesus says, no one, excuse me, John says this about Jesus. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father has made him known. Jesus himself declared in John 5, I say to you, a son cannot do anything on his own but only what he sees his father doing for he does, for what he does his son will also do. He's saying to his mother, if you're wanting me to do this, to take care of this, as I do, I'm stepping into a new role. Caring for the sins of humanity, not just for our little family at home. When he says, my hour has not yet come, he's using a, a phrase uh, that means more an opportune time. Kairos, not chronos, which is tick-tock of a clock. His hour has come now that he's stepping into this. In other words, we could read this as the moment of my death is coming, but not yet. But when it does, it will bring about the salvation of humanity through my death and resurrection. And the Spirit will be poured out to the church to be God's action in the world. And one day I will return to fulfill the Father's promise of a new heaven and new earth. When God will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there shall be no more death or mourning, wailing or pain, for the old order has passed away. See, Jesus was stepping into the mission, the purpose that his father had for him. That meant fulfilling a moment in time, but also stepping away from his family. Now, after we see or hear Jesus say, my hour has not yet come, Mary responds with, do whatever he tells you. I love how she has complete confidence in Jesus' goodness. She knows he will take care of things. I wonder, do you have that kind of faith in Jesus? When things are going wrong, do you take your problems to him? And sometimes, by the way, Jesus will instantaneously heal the situation. Other times it might mean stepping in and trusting he will guide you through the challenges to come. I have to just tell you the story. We just had our entrepreneurs group in between our services, and one of the guys came this morning, said, you know, I had a long week. I almost didn't come to church, but I really felt I needed to. And then I heard in the first service about the entrepreneurs group talking about having difficult conversations. And later today, I have to fire someone. And I didn't want to have that conversation. I really like this person, but we just cannot continue to have them work for us. So I came to this. And while we were listening and learning how to have difficult conversations, while we were hearing some of the insights he heard from the one sharing, he got a message on his phone. 
He looks at his phone, and the woman he's supposed to fire quit. <laughs> he was like, I'm never skipping church again. <laughs> God answers prayers. You know, that's the easiest way to have a difficult conversation when they leave, right? But we need to understand that Jesus brings quality to life. That's what this shows us, that we can just coast through life, ups and downs, but he wants to bring something so much better, the choicest wine instead of the tap water of life. Jesus brings quality to life. Let's look again, verse 6. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best till now. And there's so many beautiful images in this moment, like the significance of the stone jars made out of limestone that were resistant to impurities permeating the stone jars, making refilling these jars with water or wine possible given that they were used in ceremonial washing of hands and utensils before eating. It's pointing to this idea that you might come to this water to be clean, but ultimately the blood of Jesus is what cleanses us from the inside. See, wine has come to represent the blood of Jesus. That's why we take wine at communion. There's also the quantity of wine. Each stone jar held 20 to 30 gallons. That's like 12 kegs of wine. Unless you're a wine denier and think that Jesus turned water into Welch's. <laughs> and I hate to burst your crayon apple bubble, but it was actual wine. Right? There's also this interesting link between Jesus turning water into wine, allegorically unwinding paganism's belief in the fertility god of Dionysius, the son of Zeus, who is also the god of wine, invoking Jesus as the monotheistic god in the flesh who can turn water into wine and not pink Chablis, or boxed wine from Trader Joe's. It was the best wine. But I, what I find even more interesting is the link between Moses and Jesus. There's a Hebrew scriptures parallel found in God turning the water in the Nile, which was used to cleanse people into a river of blood. You see the people of Israel being held as slaves. And in order for them to be set free Pharaoh, who was hard-hearted, experienced ten plagues, all representing the gods of Egypt, showing the God of the Hebrews was the one true God. And one of those was the water in the Nile turning to blood. Moses was freeing the people in a physical sense, but Jesus had come to free us spiritually. That we could... Be free from the chains of sin, of depression, of bitterness, of the issues that come up in life. So Jesus' death, while morbid and dark, is in the end a celebration of our freedom. The celebration of the wedding at Cana, the turning of water into wine, brings us, the bride, into communion with the bridegroom, Jesus. But then there's this question we have to ask, what's belief got to do with it? John 2, 11, it says, What Jesus did here in Cana was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. See, this word is not translated with the fullness of what it really means. In English, we can believe in statements, but it not transform our life. We can believe in the history of Jesus and the story of Jesus without truly having a relationship with God. It's not about answering Bible trivia. It's about truly connecting with God personally. See, this word is better translated in many ways as trusted in Him. They knew they could go to Him for what they needed when things were tough, when they were facing a struggle. See, too many of us have a, a connection with God that's more transactional. We go to God 
when we need something, and when we don't get what we want, we're upset with him. I mean, let's be honest. We treat a lot of relationships like that. Suddenly, I don't feel happy, so I don't want to be married. See, relationship is more than transactional. True love it requires surrender and sacrifice. And what God is inviting us into is a relationship where we can trust him through the ups and the downs, knowing that he's with us to help us through. Bertrand Russell wrote a book titled, Why I'm Not a Christian. In it, he says that most people believe in God because they have been taught from early infancy to do it, and that is the main reason. Sadly, he's not wrong. That's why so many of our 11 or 12-year-olds decide they don't want to go to church anymore, and too often parents say that's fine. Or when they're 18, they go off to college and never come back to church. It's because they were living off the fumes of their parents' faith. I once heard it said that God the Father has no grandchildren. That each of us has to choose for ourselves, do we want to actually have a relationship with God through Jesus? You know, years ago, I was asked up in Toronto, speaking at an event, and it kind of took me by surprise, this question. He said, would you explain to everyone here why you follow Jesus? And it was hard to put into words. Like, how do you explain what it's like to feel and experience forgiveness? How do you put into words what it's like to know that God is always there for you? When others might come and go, he's always there. How can you put into words what it's like to experience joy in the midst of difficult circumstances, to have peace in the midst of an anxious world? How can you put into words what it's like to know God? My invitation, my encouragement to you is with an open heart and open mind, connect with him. We invite you to read through the Gospel of John and just pray, God, show me who you are. Show, show me who you want me to be. When you seek the Lord, he will reveal himself to you. You can be amazed at how I might answer that prayer as you're reading the scriptures or throughout the day. God is real. He is speaking. The problem is too often we're not listening. Maybe you're here and you've not yet acknowledge to God that you need his forgiveness, that you need a new start, that you need him to lead and guide you. You can simply start a relationship with Jesus with the words, help, help me, forgive me, lead me, transform me. That's just the beginning of the conversation. It's in the context of that new relationship that he brings friends and community to us to help us this this life is too hard to do on our own. That's why we're asking the question, which group are you in? To make sure that you have others doing life with you. If you're not in a group, we have a new prayer group starting tomorrow night here at the building. Find a group, find community, spend time with God. Or maybe you've already had a moment where you connected with God for the first time through Jesus. Maybe you've wandered away, or maybe your relationship with Him has become transactional. Today is a chance to start afresh. Whatever struggle it is you keep going to instead of Him, today you can surrender from that. Whoever it is that you're embittered toward or struggling to forgive, ask Him to help you move past that. Let this time as the band sings this song over us be your chance to connect with God. And as we do that, let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you love us. You have life, abundant life, quality to life that you offer us. Would you help us to stop trying to grab hold of all the things and, and trust everything, surrender everything to you. All of our dreams and hopes, our regrets, our sins, our mistakes, our relationships. We surrender everything to you and trust that you give back what's best. God, guide us through the tough times that we might be a part of right now. Bring healing to relationships.
relationships, to our hearts. Help us to forgive just as we've been forgiven. God, speak to our hearts now. We pray. Make us new. In Jesus' name.